Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Ron Kisen Stevenson. Good evening. Uh, it's often said that it's good to begin a talk with an anecdote or a narrative of some kind. Well, the Lotus Sutra is full of them. There are uh, at least four very famous parables there. One of them is the parable of the jewel in the robe. Um, a beggar, as you may recall, goes about living in poverty, completely unaware that a jewel has been sewn into his garment. Uh, so what is this precious gem? And how is it that we are, in this parable, unaware of this internal wealth? Well, of course, in our practice, we find that uh, Buddhist practice is full of many realizations. We have realizations that are in accord with various teachings uh, that we may have read, Dharma that we've read or heard, perhaps never really understood in such clarity. So our practice gives us some confirmation of what it is that we experience. Um, and there are touch points that we have along the way with the literature uh, and our experience. So that is uh, another thing about our practice is it reminds us if we are veering off. So we often may not be quite sure where we are, however, in the practice, because it seems as though it's unrooted at times. We might not be quite sure what we're trying to accomplish, and that can be frustrating. Um, unlike most human activity, it isn't specifically goal-oriented. Um, and it calls on us to be receptive rather than aggressive in trying to manipulate things to our favor and to a certain end. So it really does go against the stream as the Buddha often um, characterized it. The fact is though that our awareness unfolds by degree, each degree uh, being a crack in the edifice of ego. Ego is that monument that we build to self, that feeling that this personal experience, this that I'm having is separate and alienated somehow from the whole. Uh, why do we feel this sense of self torn away from the whole? Um, it's as though we're adrift in space, untethered, unmoored, uh, isolated, alone, infinitely vulnerable. Why do we feel that way? Well, the drive to survive and protection of the self is of course inherent in form. It's inherent in the pull of form. Uh, this is uh, part of our instinctual reaction to danger. And of course, this is true of all sentient beings um, in their drive to survive. But the difference is that in our mental activity we, that we bring to these existential threats uh, to our environment, we, we happen to create these complex neural associations and pathways that drive chronic anxiety, fear, anger, dislike, depression. And the net result of all this is a sense of self that's at odds with everything else. Uh, we call it ego. It's the lone self. It's when the, Duda, when the Buddha talked about dukkha being a wheel that's crooked on its axis, we are that wheel. We are that wheel that is about to be untethered from the whole. That is the sense of ego. Um, ego is a monument we build to ourselves. Uh, picture it as a statue, if you will. Just picture a statue that you build to yourself right now. Um, this is how we see ourselves. This is me, myself. I am something tangible. I'm solid. I'm real. I think, I feel, therefore I am. I must be permanent. I must survive. Uh, I must preserve this. Um, I cling to this form. Clinging is what happens when mind meets form. 
So this statue that we build really uh, memorializes all these stories of self that we have. And since we, our brain has so many folds, there are many stories of self going on in, in the mansion of our mind. Um, but the stories are fictional. Inaccurate measures of the world that uh, we relate to and, and inaccurate notions of who we are. The stories simplify, they cherry pick, they alter the mood and setting to match expectations, conditioning. Uh, and inside me are a thousand of these me's. Each one is stored in the mind, connected to various feelings, sensations, perceptions, impulses, mental activities, and triggered by various stimuli. And we seemingly have no control of this. Every past memory of trauma, expectation, disappointment can be dredged up by a certain stimuli in a moment. Emotions and behaviors triggered. Um, so when that happens, we feel completely isolated and threatened. And this is how most of humanity feels forced to live. Nation states, they vie for hegemony over others' resources, making enemies of one another, um, asserting um, fear, greed-driven behavior, a collective ego. As someone who's white, who's male, etc. This is part of that collective ego. Do animals feel this way? Well, not demonstrably. Um, even though I'm aware that in Buddhism, the animal realm, which is metaphorical, is kind of misportrayed as a place of fear and reactivity, these are really human habitual states that we impute to the animals. An animal has no sense of self separate from his environment. Have you ever observed a cat, for example, sitting just completely still, but focused on every sound, ears moving in all directions? The cat completely occupies that space and that moment. They're not merely in the room, but completely present in that environment of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Unless there's an immediate threat, they do not react. They react in the moment and it passes. In other words, they experience the entirety of being in this very moment. While they have memories of the past, and maybe thoughts of the future, they do not interfere with this moment. And this is not a new discovery. Throughout Buddhist history, people have awakened to this realization. I would like to talk about um, a guy eight centuries back in 1240, uh, Dogen Zenji in Japan. Uh, he wrote what was at the time a very obscure essay uh, called The Time Being, or Uji, U meaning uh, being and G meaning time. Uh, we would hyphenate this or put a, a dash between it or a, a, a slash. Um, it, it can be being time, time being time is nothing other than being, and being is nothing other than time. Um, this is how he explained it. Time being means time itself is being, and all being is time. Uh, Dogen wrote, since there is nothing but just this moment, the time being is all the time there is. He also wrote this, each moment is all being is the entire world. Reflect now whether any being or any world 
is left out of the present moment. Eckhart Tolle calls this the now. The Buddha called it awakening. When examining time being, or the now, we find that time has the quality of flow. Uh, Dogen explained that the time is not a discrete series of moments waiting in queue to manifest one after the other by turn. Uh, there is only one single moment ever. And that moment simply constantly transitions, flows, just like yourself, your five skandhas are constantly changing. And so this moment, this time moment, this time being. In fact, you and this moment are the same. The moment is all of being. This is awakening. There's no separation in the moment. All myriad things are linked in the moment by the moment. Dogen writes, know that in this way, there are myriads of forms and hundreds of grasses, blades of grass, throughout the entire earth. Yet each blade and each form itself is the entire earth. The study of this is the beginning of practice. Since there is nothing but just this moment, the time being is all the time there is. Each moment is all being, is the entire world. Reflect now whether any being or any world is left out of the present moment. So when an external trigger stimulates some activation of an old stored memory and its associated feelings, and we find ourselves mindlessly reacting, it is possible to awaken to the moment instead. And this deactivates your programming. Far beyond that, the moment is not only the entirety of what is, it is the gateway to awareness. Now, how convenient is that, right? Um, the earliest meditations in Buddhism, of course, taught, taught uh, the meditation on the feeling, the sensations in the body, the breathing. This takes you out of the mind stream, awareness of sensation. Uh, it's the gateway to the now, the time being. Dogen puts it this way, just actualize all time as all being. There is nothing extra. Well, is it really that simple? And what if the moment isn't that great? Um, someone once said that during hard times, this is the worst time to be spiritual. In fact, it could be the best. When we are challenged and emotional reactions arise, fear, anger, dislike, contempt, sadness, this is a precious window into our habitual thought patterns. We can interrupt them with awareness. Um, the pull of form is constant as long as we have form, but the pull of habituated patterns of mind are breakable, although they make them seem irresistible. Uh, Buddhism, of course, our practice gives us the tools to be aware of these patterns. Um, and that's really at the core of our practice, isn't it? The next time we encounter someone that we react against, we may um, feel antipathy toward or stereotype. Try showering them with love instead. Suddenly a pattern is broken. Um, so the gem that's sewn into the garment of your hem is nothing more than time being. Thank you for being here with me in this time being.